The first season of Ted Lasso was released when its wholesome positivity was needed the most. A show that very few people believed in came onto the scene and rescued people from the troubling day-to-day -day of the pandemic. Ted Lasso was what television needed at the time. Propelled by being the right show at the right time, Ted Lasso hooked audiences with its rootable characters, relatable situations, and dynamic storytelling. A dramedy that gave just as many emotional moments as it did gut-busting laughs. Its smart, people-centric way of storytelling made it a cult hit and saw the show win 11 Emmys, with it winning the Emmy for Outstanding Comedy Series in back-to-back -back years. So when season 3 was set to premiere on Apple TV Plus on March 15th, people were excited to see the show return. And while season 3 of Ted Lasso is still a relatively enjoyable watch, it no longer seemed to have the same impact that it once did. Like its titular character, Ted Lasso season 3 seems to struggle with the idea that it is still on the air 3 years later. As a result, the season felt considerably less focused than its predecessors, as the writers spend much of their time treading water until they can bring a satisfying ending to the characters' journeys. The writers seemed so focused on how the story would end that I think they fumbled somewhat in the setup. As for a number of characters, the journey seems less important so long as they reach their final landing point. And that is not to say that the season's conclusion is not good. In fact, I think it's one of the strongest aspects of season 3. However, I think the rest of the season that led up to that point feels like a massive dip in quality from the previous seasons. Over the course of the video, I will dissect season 3 of Ted Lasso in detail, highlighting both the successes and failures of the show. Spoiler warning for Ted Lasso season 3. I'm upset because the team that I own is projected to finish last this season and my manager decided to skip training and take our players into a fucking sewer. I think season 3 has a really great start, as it comes out of the gates with a sense of urgency. After the finale of season 2, and knowing that Nate has joined forces with Rupert at West Ham United, West Ham United, pickup trucks, there was a lot of anticipation to see where that storyline would go. And the opening episodes show West Ham as a great contrast to how things are done at Richmond. It feels like West Ham is the Empire, with Rupert and Nate filling in the roles of Emperor Palpatine and Darth Vader. Rupert has even got the circular windows and swivel throne. West Ham feels big, corporate, and in some ways isolating. My lord? Ugh. My lord? Go f yourself. My lord? Go f yourself. My lord? Go f yourself. My lord? Go f yourself! Aww. There's a top-down demand for success, and they're willing to do anything to achieve it, including berating their players and mocking their opponents. Everyone, this is the dum-dum line. This is where dum-dums go. Stay. You, go in for the dum-dum. Try not to join him on the line. Nate is a proponent of this behavior, as he takes a hard-line approach to coaching, caring little about the people and seeing them more as pawns at his disposal. He is still media-obsessed and terrified of looking foolish. And yet, there is a feeling that Nate doesn't quite belong at West Ham. We get this feeling through scenes like where his humble little buggy is going to be towed, because in the eyes of Rupert, it doesn't belong amongst the Lambos and McLarens of the elites. Nate is gifted an Aston Martin to help him better assimilate into Rupert's world, and the audience is left to wonder how much further down this road will Nate go. Nate is also being subtly manipulated by Rupert, telling him to call him either Rupert or Mr. Mannion depending on whether Nate proves himself worthy. Thank you, Mr. Mannion. Oh, no, please, Nathan, call me Rupert. Night, Rupert. Mr. Mannion. He has slotted himself into the role of a father figure for Nate, and he is not shy about withholding his praise and affection as Rupert sees Nate in a similar way to how Nate views his players, as a tool to get what he wants. Over in Richmond, we get to see another owner-manager relationship play out. There's a really interesting dynamic between Rebecca and Ted early in the season, as they are on the other ends of the spectrum concerning the upcoming season. Ted is at his least engaged, as he is questioning why is he even still in England, his heart not really in the job, whereas Rebecca is the most committed she has ever been to the Greyhounds, striving for victory with a bold determination. And even though Rebecca loves Ted as a person, and is grateful for everything that he has done for the club, and her personally, he is who he is. He's the type of coach to not care about being projected to finish last, who won't respond when publicly mocked and insulted, and will stop a practice to take the team for a sewer tour. Ted is a great coach for building team chemistry, but when your goal is to win, is he still the right man for the job? Rebecca finds herself asking this very question, as she and Ted find themselves at odds several times. The club is going in the wrong direction, and I fear that it has little to do with the quality of our players. 
we may have to consider changing the manager of our club. This fast-paced section of the season culminates with a game between Richmond and West Ham. Touted as a battle between titans with both teams top of the standings, the game allows us to explore even more character dynamics. After publicly clowning on Richmond and Ted personally, I hope we have to train in a sewer because their coach is so shitty. <laughs> Nate is starting to feel guilty, as he is to face his former mentor in person for the first time since he left. He plans on apologizing, but is never actually able to do it, and he even snubs Ted during the post-game handshake. I think this shows that Nate is still wrapped up in his own world, and not yet truly thinking about others in the way that he should be. There he is, the wonder kid himself. Get out. The match itself sees an intense first half with both sides playing well until the final minute where Nate pulls some galaxy brain plays to gain the lead heading into the break. Trying to gain a competitive advantage, Coach Beard and Roy show the team a video of Nate destroying the Believe sign at the end of the second season. They do this against Ted's wishes as the Greyhounds are whipped up into a frenzy. They go into the second half seeing red, no longer focusing on winning but on taking their pound of flesh. They played with hate and anger, which is very much not the lasso way. With the game over and Richmond soundly defeated after playing the wrong way, the audience is left satisfied and excited to see the next time these two sides face off and how the characters will have changed in the time between. Unfortunately though, the next time the teams meet is incredibly anticlimactic as by that time the show has shifted so much that the things that matter to the characters no longer matter to them. After seeing the whole season, this almost feels like the end of these characters' stories in relation to each other, as everyone is given new motivations for the rest of the season. It feels disappointing because it almost feels like the show is saying that none of this, or the way the characters acted in these moments, mattered at all. Ted Lasso has never been a show about soccer. Soccer is merely the vehicle which facilitates the characters on their journey to become their very best selves. However, I think a big climactic game played between two sides with a ton of personal history had great potential to showcase the messages of the show in a manner that felt satisfying. I think the route they took instead ultimately feels underwhelming, as it resolves the story's conflicts before the match even starts, something I will talk about more in depth later on in the video. I let all of my children name themselves once they reach the age of seven. That is why my eldest is called Smingus Dingus. Another factor adding to the sense of urgency during the first few episodes of the season is Zava. Zava is based on Swedish football star Zlatan Ibrahimovic, who is known for speaking in the third person, along with saying and doing some of the most ridiculous things. Lions, they don't compare themselves with humans. <laughs> Zlatan was ripe for parody. With Zava announcing that he wants to play in the Premier League, it's a race to wine, dine, and sign the star footballer before anyone else can. When Rebecca learns that Rupert is trying to lure Zava to West Ham, she throws her hat into the ring. When it looks like Rupert might have just sweet-talked Zava, Rebecca marches into the men's washroom and berates Zava in the smell of his urine. She challenges him, telling him that he's not as great as he once was, and if he really wanted to show that he's still the best, he would sign with Richmond, to prove that he can win with any team, and not just those that are already powerhouses. It's a great scene, both dramatic and comedic. And it works, as Zava chooses to sign with Richmond. I have changed my mind. Zava will not play for Chelsea. Zava will play for Richmond. During Zava's time with Richmond, he comes across almost as a spiritual guru, a cult of personality that infects the team. He has some pretty funny moments throughout his time on the show. While he is an enigma off the pitch, he is a god on it, as he spends most of his time at Richmond doing bicycle kicks and scoring incredible goals. His dominant play shoots Richmond up the standings, until one day he just disappears. Where's Zava? And this is where my issue with Zava comes up. They just decide to randomly write him out of the show in the most contrived way possible showing that they had very little respect for the character. Now, on paper, I understand the need to write Zava out, because they don't want a character who was just introduced this season to be the one to control what happens with Richmond. The success of the characters should be based on the lessons that they learn, and not because the soccer gods showed up out of nowhere. Moreover, Ted Lasso is a story about underdogs, and as long as Zava is on the team, they are no longer the underdogs. The writers needed to bring the show back to its equilibrium. My issue isn't that they wrote Zava out, my issue is the lazy half-assed way that they did it. Zava leaves the show to go work on his avocado farm. This comes completely out of left field, and really feels like they only introduced Zava to make some Zlatan jokes and then they were done with him. In my mind, he is still a character that the show has set up with his own motivation. He joins Richmond to prove that he is still the best and can win with any team. 
Did the writers just forget about this, or what? I guess their justification is just that Zava is a weird, kooky character who will do anything, and that feels weak to me. There are so many ways to write Zav out of the show without contradicting the character's established motivation. The easiest is just have Zava get injured. Problem solved. Richmond is back to their underdog status as they reel from the loss of Zava and have to dig deep to show that they can do it without him. What I think is an even better idea is to have Zava leave after the way Richmond played in the second half against West Ham United. Zava doesn't have the same baggage involving Nate or the same investment into the believe sign, so to him, his team unjustly lost their minds and behaved in a way that he found shameful. He leaves because he feels like he can't abide by such behavior. This causes the team to take a hard look in the mirror, setting up their growth in the second half. Also, pouring a little salt into the wound is on the cover of one of the magazines while Ted is at the airport, it is revealed that Zava is coming out of retirement. So while I enjoy Zava's time during the season, I feel like the way he was handled highlights some of the issues in the writing this season, and how the writers are willing to cut corners. I mean, it'll become evident, I think, as the season you know, rolls out that just the uh, amount of content, you know, like just the episodes are there's a lot of stories. I think one of the biggest issues with season 3 of Ted Lasso is its poor pacing. Some episodes seemingly drag on forever, with little actually happening. After the success of its first season, Apple upped the episode order from 10 to 12, and seemingly gave the showrunners more freedom in the lengths of the episodes. And while at first this seems like a good thing because it means more Ted Lasso, I fear that the byproduct of the increased episode order is that the show just doesn't have enough compelling material to fill the time. You can start to feel this a bit in season 2, when they dedicated an entire episode to Coach Beard running around late at night, but for the most part it wasn't too bad. It wasn't quite the level of deliberate storytelling of season 1, but it was still relatively trim, if a little indulgent at times. Unfortunately, the chickens really come home to roost in season 3, as the showrunners really drag out the story dedicating significant screen time to needless storylines and characters. Things that would be cut in previous seasons are left in to toil in Season 3, with the writers including every subpar idea they came up with to drown out the actual good content the show has to offer. This becomes even more apparent when you look at the difference in episode run times for the three seasons. Not only did Season 1 feature 10 episodes, but each of those episodes had a runtime between 29 and 33 minutes, for an average episode length of 31 minutes, and a total of 309 minutes of screen time. Season 2's 12 episodes ran from 30 minutes all the way up to 49 minutes. Its average episode length was 39 minutes, and the total amount of screen time was 466 minutes. I think these numbers are fine for the most part, as the show still felt like it was making good use of its runtime. Season 3, however, is where things start to get out of control. The lowest episode time in Season 3 was 43 minutes in length, and the season's longest episode ran 75 minutes. Of the 12 episodes, a quarter of them were over an hour in length, a time neither of the first two seasons really came close to. The average episode length was 55 minutes, and the total runtime was 660 minutes. That's over double the total screen time of Season 1, and nearly 200 minutes longer than Season 2, which had the same number of episodes. When looking at this data, it's no wonder that Season 3 feels slow and boring for a large portion of it. What makes things worse is that even though the show is at its longest it's ever been, they decide to dedicate screen time to random garbage in favor of ignoring meaningful and important plot developments. Season 3 has this bad habit of cutting away or telling the audience major plot developments instead of showing the audience. When Colin is about to come out to the team, a moment the show has built up all season, they cut away, and then when they cut back to him, he has already told the team. This is the climax of Colin's story, and instead of hearing from him, we get to listen to Ted ramble on for two minutes about the Denver Broncos. Did you just compare being gay to being a Denver Broncos fan? You know what, I did and I regret it. Yeah, sorry about that. Another major moment that the show tells us what happened, instead of showing us, is Nate quitting his job at West Ham. It feels like it comes out of nowhere, because even though Nate was having his doubts, we don't actually see him come to any decision, and when this vital information is given to the audience, it is done in a recap. The mysterious managerial vacancy at West Ham United. The club has suddenly parted ways with the wonder kid. Nathan Shelley. It's a shocker, Jeff. Decisions like these make the story feel disjointed and makes it hard to get invested. It's almost as if the writers are using this tell-don't-show method of storytelling in order to brush past potential sticking points. 
A great example of this is when Will, Colin, and Isaac visit Nate at the restaurant to tell him that they forgive him and the entire team unanimously wants him back at Richmond. And the audience is just kind of like, huh? The last time they saw or even talked about Nate was during the second half of the game against West Ham, where they were so mad at him that they started attacking his team as a proxy. How do we go from that immense hatred and anger for desecrating the belief sign and insulting them to them unanimously wanting him back? The whole team talked about it and it was unanimous. It kind of feels like the team discussing the possibility of Nate coming back would be a big deal, so why don't we see it? I think we're only told about it because it allows the writers to rush past having to actually justify the decision when they really have no reason to want back or to forgive him. They are planning to connect the dots, but instead of actually connecting the dots, they are just telling the audience, don't worry, they connect. These poor pacing moments show that the writers are willing to engage in poor methods of storytelling, which not only diminishes the quality of the show, but tries to cheat the audience. They don't have time to show us genuinely important story moments, but we have more than enough time to show Shandy being an idiot. Well, I think I've got it. So you've hired a former model with no previous experience, no higher education for a job that doesn't exist. The pacing issues are prevalent throughout many of the season's storylines, and Keeley's PR storyline might be one of the worst victims of it. So much of her storyline feels like filler, as we watch her try and navigate her new position as the head of her own PR firm. It's devoid of any really funny or entertaining moments, and subjects the audience to the likes of Jack and Shandy. Perhaps the worst part about Keeley's storyline this season is that she feels almost entirely isolated from the rest of the characters. She's off in her own little world that feels like it's a Ted Lasso spin-off, where we follow Keeley interact with her new office, with brief cameos from Ted Lasso alumni. Much of the season sees Keeley actively avoiding Rebecca, robbing us of that relationship. She barely interacts with Ted and Jamie, who are both key to her development in the past, and she and Roy break up almost immediately, leaving their interactions for the rest of the season sparse and awkward. In regards to the breakup with Roy, I can get behind it on paper, as Keeley's journey from the first season was to stop being defined by her relationships and to show her own value through her actions and work ethic rather than her looks. I think the writers may have decided to break up the pair to emphasize that Keeley is a self-made woman, not defined by her romantic relationship. That's why it's so confusing later on when they make her and Jack a couple. I thought the breakup with Roy would have given the show a chance to further explore Keeley as an individual, as it would be the first time in the whole series that she wasn't in a relationship for a prolonged period of time. Instead, they immediately get her involved with Jack, undercutting some of her own independence. Jack is not only Keeley's boss, but is the person funding her PR firm. But getting in a relationship with her, which in itself is a bad idea because of the power dynamic, she is giving up a lot of her own agency. It feels almost like she is right where she started, but instead of being a trophy wife to Jamie, she is a trophy wife to Jack. Jack treats Keeley like a doll, and tries to dictate how Keeley acts. Now Keeley eventually stands up for herself, and Jack breaks up with her, but still feels like treading ground we have already covered, and that it reduces Keeley as a character. Dating Jack was also a bad idea, because once they break up, Jack pulls funding from Keeley's firm, causing them to go under. I feel like this further reduces Keeley's character, as she is then bailed out by Rebecca. It makes Keeley look stupid and incapable of smartly running her business, as the decision she made led to her failure. For Rebecca to fund her after the fact makes it seem less like Keeley is a capable independent woman and more like a ditz with friends in high places. The show's inclusion of Shandy, an annoying character that makes almost all of her scenes extremely painful, feels like the writers trying to kill two birds with one stone. They wanted to create a character who they could go to to act abrasive in the hopes of getting some easy laughs, and they included Keeley hiring her to show some of the things that Keeley still needs to learn about running a business. This is Shandy, we work together. Oh. And she's a great friend of mine. Oh. As a teaching moment for Keeley, I don't hate the idea of Shandy, but in the further context of Keeley's other business decisions, it makes it seem less like a learning moment and more like Keeley being incompetent. Overall, I think Keeley's PR firm storyline was one of the more boring, slow-paced plots of the season, as well as doing some major damage to Keeley's character and the growth that she has undergone in the previous two seasons. It's in your hand an object. It's very special. It's a green matchbook. Who cares about a green matchbook? <laughs> Coming into this season, Rebecca having her future foreseen by a psychic was not something I would have expected or wanted. 
If I'm being honest, I just had a really hard time getting invested in this storyline. Maybe it's just me, but Rebecca being paranoid about matchbooks is not all that entertaining. Also, the psychic's visions are of the most random useless crap that have almost no significance outside of the fact that the psychic mentioned them. A green matchbook? Just something that Sam gives her that has no hidden meaning or narrative value. It's not part of a fun or interesting scene. Rebecca just gets a green matchbook. Similarly, the phrase shite in nining armor isn't even given in a funny context. Some lady just jumbles her words while telling a story. My shite in nining armor. The purpose of these predictions is to get Rebecca believing in the prophecy, but are themselves not interesting or meaningful. The only predictions of any consequence are that Rebecca will fall into the water and that she will be a mother. And even then, it leads her to have a great night in Amsterdam with a man who she then meets again later. Like, it's fine I guess, but the psychic element to it adds almost nothing. I feel like this was a feeble attempt to give more meaning to her new relationship, and I don't think it really does. What about you, coach? You alright when they come? If you bring that Judas back, I will burn this place to the fucking ground. Coming into the season, I was most excited for the continuation of Nate's story. His evolution over the course of the first two seasons was some of the best character work in the show, as they subtly show Nate come into his own before getting alienated. I think early in the season, where we find Nate feels like a genuine continuation of his character. He has become embittered and power hungry while still at his core being a dork who doesn't fit in Rupert's world. However, after beating Richmond in episode 4, Nate almost feels like an entirely different character. It's not a gradual change either. The first four episodes he is mostly a jerk with a few moments of guilt, and then suddenly he is back to the awkward kind-hearted Nate of season 1. We don't really have any reason for this sudden change, it just happens. Unfortunately, most of Nate's storyline during the rest of the season feels forced, as the show wants us to like and forgive Nate without showing us how or why he has changed. I think they do a decent job continuing to push the idea that Nate doesn't quite belong at West Ham, with his day with Anastasia, dipping out on Rupert, and his attempt to form the Love Hounds. But even then, some of these actions still show Nate in a selfish light, as with the Love Hounds, he is less interested in listening to what the others are concerned about, and more interested in getting their feedback on his love life. Not with how things are going on in our personal life. I'd love to talk about the stresses of taking care of my aging parents. Get out. I think they're trying to base a lot of Nate being a nice guy again on his relationship with Jade and his family. When it comes to Jade, I really don't think it works, because who is this woman? For most of her scenes, Jade is blank faced giving us nothing. I don't know anything about her, least of all why she wants to be in a relationship with Nate, someone who she seemingly disliked and even rejected in the previous season. Perhaps she'd like to give me a number as well. No, that's okay. Why did she change her mind and decide to go out with him? It doesn't help that whenever they are about to interact together during the early stages of their relationship, the show zooms out and starts playing music, leaving the audience to wonder what they are talking about. It feels like another shortcut where the show tries to imply chemistry rather than actually doing the work and showing the two interact. By the end of the season, I know as much about Jade as I knew at the start. The only difference is the writers used her as a tool to put Nate in his happy place so that he seems like less of a jerk. In regards to his family, the only major progress in their relationship occurs after Nate has already made his season-defining decision and quit his job at West Ham. So his improved family relationship really has little to no impact on his change. I've already talked about how telling us Nate quit his job rather than showing us how he came to that decision and the act itself is a massive problem. However, I just want to re-emphasize here that by missing this crucial information, it makes everything that comes after hard to believe. It's like the writers had the idea of Nate coming back to Richmond as this big lesson about the good in people stuck in their heads that they were willing to take any shortcut necessary to get to it. Unfortunately, that also robs it of feeling earned and satisfying, making the whole thing ring hollow. I don't understand how you're not pissed off with Nate. They have Beard give a genuinely terrific speech about forgiveness to get over the last hurdle. And the moment and performance are so good that it allows the audience Audience to almost forget about all the bad writing that got us there. However, for me, it's not able to make up for all of the gaps in the plot. Hopefully people have kind of bought the redemption and, and forgiven him, because that's what I think season three is about. It's about, you know, our capacity is uh, to forgive, really. Overall, Nate's storyline this season was one of the most disappointing and frustrating. All I want is for when we win a match, 
to be able to kiss my feather. The same way that guys get to kiss their girls. When I learned that Colin, who was a pretty tertiary character to this point, was getting his own storyline, I was excited. I thought the idea of exploring Colin's homosexuality in the context of his job to be interesting, as in real life, I feel like that there are very few openly gay athletes, at least in the sports that I follow. This person uh, pretend to be straight, but he's really gay. Me. And I think there's some stigmas about pro athletes being gay, and an added pressure on them as they can be pigeonholed as the gay football player or the gay hockey player rather than just another player. Something I really enjoyed about Colin's storyline is his relationship with Trent Krim, Independent. When Trent reveals to Colin that he already knows, it allows Colin to put down his walls and really open up about a lot of the struggles that he has been having. Trent feels like an older brother who has been through it all before, and who Colin can go to for advice. Their heart to heart in Amsterdam was a great moment, and really allowed a deeper look into the characters. Something I think was a little less great was how Isaac reacts after finding out that Colin is gay. I think his actions are meant to illustrate that he is angry at Colin not because he is gay, but because Colin never told him, and as a result, he felt like he was being lied to. You lied to me for years. What is it about me that made you think you couldn't tell me? However, the way they have Isaac respond to this information feels like massive overkill. He won't talk to Colin, he won't look at Colin, he rolls his eyes whenever he hears Colin speak, he doesn't even want his hand to touch Colin's in the team huddle. It really seems like the show is trying to make the audience think Isaac is homophobic by having him react so extremely. The two share a nice moment after the fact when Isaac visits Colin, but I wasn't a fan of the lead up to that. As mentioned previously, Colin coming out to the team being cut off and then having Ted go on was not well handled. With this being Colin's life and story, it feels like he should have been the one to tell it, not Ted. The storyline wasn't bad, but it was a bit of a mixed bag. It had some good moments and some sloppy ones. Well, I guess I do sometimes wonder what the heck I'm still doing here. I mean, I know why I came, but it's the uh, sticking around I can't quite figure out. One of the most complete stories this season was Ted and his desire to go home. The season opens up on a close-up of Ted's dejected face, as he sits in the airport and prepares to send Henry on his way home to America. As Henry leaves, Ted is left to wonder, what is he still doing in England? The thing that truly matters to him is now on the other side of the world, and he wonders, why isn't he there with him? As the season goes on, Ted is mostly going through the motions, his heart no longer truly in it. His feelings of being adrift are cemented further as he slowly starts to learn things that are going on back in America. For starters, he finds out that his ex-wife Michelle has started dating another man. Now this may hurt Ted on a personal level because it further tells him that Michelle has moved on, but the thing that really hurts him is that he wasn't told or consulted that a new person was being introduced to their child and would be acting as another parental figure. The reason Michelle likely didn't tell him is because her new beau isn't some random, but rather their former marriage counselor. This feels incredibly unethical. Well, my ex-wife's dating our ex-marriage counselor, so, you know, that's new. Wow. <laughs> borderline unethical. As it's possible that during their counseling sessions, Dr. Jacob purposefully torpedoed Ted's relationship so that he could get together with Michelle after the fact. It makes Jake look like a massive snake and doesn't paint Michelle in a great light either. It also makes Ted wonder if Michelle is keeping something as big as this from him, what else could she be keeping from him? Another major moment is when Ted learns that Henry acted out in school and bullied another kid. After Ted's initial shock, I think Ted starts to feel guilty, as he feels like him not being there might have been one of the causes for Henry acting up. But hey, maybe my being here is doing more hurt than helping at this point, you know? He feels like he is letting his son down, as he is the reluctant absentee father. This is only further reinforced when Ted's mom visits, and point blank tells him that Henry misses him, causing Ted to break down into tears. When it is revealed that Ted plans on leaving at the end of the season, it makes perfect sense. He shares a fantastic scene with Rebecca as she tries to convince him to stay as he means so much for the club. And even though Rebecca is making the best case she can, you can see in Ted's solemn expression that he has already made up his mind, and for him, it's the right decision. As Ted arrives back in America, we see how excited Henry is to have him back. Ted becomes Henry's soccer coach, his time in Richmond bleeding over into his new life. In a mirror of the season's opening shot, we see a close-up of Ted. 
Only this time, he is smiling. This time, he is happy. I think Ted's story this season was one of the storylines that was the most consistent and that the show did a great job with. I just genuinely don't care anymore. As I mentioned earlier, I feel like the show kind of dropped the ball with the final game against West Ham, because I feel like it lacked any real stakes. By the time the match starts, all of the characters have already finished their arcs and have nothing left to learn. Rebecca, who at the beginning of the season had desperately wanted to beat Rupert, no longer cares because Rupert tried to kiss her and she finally realized how pathetic he is. Nate already quit his job and has been welcomed back at Richmond. It really just feels like there are no stakes for anyone except for Rupert. And while I get that's kind of the point, I feel like it makes the match far less interesting. Like if Rebecca or Nate had their big revelation during the match, I think that would be much more impactful. For example, if Rupert pushed Nate instead of Nutsack Boy, I think Nate's refusal to play to injure would be a lot more meaningful. Also, I just have to say that if a game like this happened for real, the West Ham fans would be enraged. They get called for a penalty on a bit of a sell job from Jamie, they have a goal scored on them that blew through the netting, and then they have one of their goals disallowed. There would be riots, and I would worry for the safety of the referees. I am not your bro. We are no enemies, and soon? You will be my bitch. I feel like I spent a lot of this video ragging on the things that I didn't like, so I just wanted to take a little bit of time to highlight some of the things I did like. For starters, one of the highlights of the season was Jamie and Roy's relationship. They are two of the best characters on the show, and every time they share a scene together, you get some of the best that the show has to offer. Watching their friendship develop as they grow as individuals was also great to watch unfold. I would have given it its own section in this video, but I'll talk about it some more in my Why Jamie Tart is the Best Character in Ted Lasso video. So if you want to hear more about my thoughts on the storyline and their dynamic, give that video a watch. I also like how the episodes involving Chelsea and Manchester City have a focus on their former players in Roy and Jamie respectively. I thought it was a great heartwarming moment when the entire team comes in to fix Sam's restaurant after it had been vandalized. Seeing his dad's reaction to the restaurant being named after him was also great. Ted's BBQ vision quest was also a fun little aside that allowed the show to experiment with some new visuals. I think two of the funniest characters this season are Will and Danny. Will's coach beard impression was really funny, and it was also funny with the continued gag of Will always being in the boot room when people burst in. Danny was great the entire season as well, from being a Zava fanboy and copying him, to him turning into evil Danny when he put on his Mexico jersey and was playing for his country. Him wanting to see the tulip was also hilarious. And I think someone picked tulip, yes? But who? Danny, you wrote it in Spanish. Someone wrote it in Spanish? Yes. And he even showed us his inner Scott Sterling. <laughs> Because maybe people at the end would be like, oh no, you know what? That's it. Thank you. Like, that, that's all we need. Even though I was pretty negative in regards to the content of much of the season, I think its ending is actually great and leaves every character in the perfect spot. Ted goes back home to be with his son. Roy gets to be named the new manager at Richmond. Keely is back to running her PR firm, hopefully a little more competently this time around. Trent finished his book. Rebecca gets the family she always wanted. Jamie reconnects with his dad. Sam makes the Nigerian national team. Although, does this mean Ikufu just stopped paying to have him blacklisted? I will never stop. And Danny and his two girlfriends get to live happily ever after. For pretty much all of the characters, I feel like this is the best ending that they could have gotten. At the time this video is being made, there is no announcement of a fourth season, and I honestly hope that the show ends here. I think if they decide to continue the show, it will start to overstay its welcome and continue to lose focus until the show is a pale imitation of what it once was. If it ends now, the show ends with a great three season arc, consisting of two terrific seasons and an okay one with a good ending. I feel like the show will be remembered fondly and revisited by many people. In my opinion, Ted Lasso has said what it has had to say. It showed up when it was most needed and now it's time for it to end. You've done this over three seasons. I have. Yes. By slowly but surely building a club-wide culture of trust and support through thousands of imperceptible moments, all leading to their inevitable conclusion. In a lot of ways, I found my feelings about season 3 of Ted Lasso to be complicated. I love the world and the characters so much. However, I was let down by a lot of the writing decisions and shortcuts that were taken. 
It also feels bloated, making it hard to enjoy the good aspects of the season as they are drowned out by huge amounts of time dedicated to needless, boring moments and storylines. The drop off in quality from seasons 1 and 2 to season 3 is very noticeable, and I can't help but wonder if the show's early successes gave the showrunners too much creative freedom so that they were no longer forced to make a focused show that only included the best bits that they were free to explore ideas that would have been left on the cutting room floor of previous seasons. I still think overall, Ted Lasso is a great show, and would recommend it to almost anyone. Where I would rank season 1 of the show a mid-9, and season 2 a mid-8, unfortunately, I feel like season 3 warrants a low 6. I still enjoyed aspects of the season, but felt much of it to be tedious to get through. Even still, I think the writers gave us a satisfying conclusion to the characters' journeys, I think the message and impact the show has had still ring true. If you somehow made it to the end of the video, I want to thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, it would mean a lot if you liked and subscribed. It really helps out the channel. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.